In the spirit of reconciliation, the University of Southern Queensland recognises that it's situated on country for which the Jarawa and Guyabal people have been custodians for many centuries and on which they perform age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation, learning and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and unique role in the life of this region and we offer our deep appreciation of their contribution to and support of our academic enterprise. Good afternoon. My name is Helen Partridge and I'm the Pro Vice-Chancellor, Scholarly Information and Learning Services at the University of Southern Queensland. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this month's USQ Salon. We'll have Denise Kufajanakis joining us to talk a little bit about evidence-based practice and the academic library. First, let me introduce you to Denise. She's the Collections and Acquisitions Coordinator at the University of Alberta Libraries in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Denise has co-founded the Open Access Journal Evidence-Based Library and Information Practice and has held several editorial positions since the journal's inception in 2006, including Editor-in-Chief. She was also co-chair of the second international conference when it was held in Edmonton in 2003. Denise has contributed to several national organisations, including the Canadian Library Association, the Council of Prairie and Pacific University Libraries and the Canadian Research Knowledge Network. She's been actively involved with librarian research training initiatives, including service, serving as a mentor and instructor at the California Academic and Research Libraries Librarians Research Institute held in Canada, and as the Library Advisory Board member of the Institute for Research Design in Librarianship in the USA. A reminder that we will be asking questions and comments at the end of the presentation, and you can email or tweet. Our hashtag is uh, USQ Salon. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Denise. Thank you, Helen. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I want to discuss evidence-based practice within academic librarianship and why it's so important especially since the nature of an academic librarian's work is changing rapidly as new technologies and modes of scholarly communication are changing how universities operate and are impacting upon the teaching and research needs of faculty. I want to briefly review some of these changes and what this has meant for the work that academic librarians do. I'll then tie this to evidence-based practice within librarianship and argue that academic librarians increasingly need to become evidence-based in their approach to their work in order to, help, in order to be able to cope with change, provide better service, and remain relevant. When you mention a library to most people, they frequently think of a beautiful old building like this one, which is Trinity College in Dublin, and associate the library as a keeper of print books. Now, while such libraries are wonderful and hopefully will exist for a long, long time, on the whole, this is not what modern libraries look like anymore. Within the past 20 or so years, libraries have faced a major shift, largely due to the internet. For example, in terms of the tools and finding aids with which libraries provide access to content, it's only been about 25 or 30 years since libraries largely stopped using what we now consider the old card catalogs. I certainly remember using a card catalog during my undergrad degree in the late 1980s and early 1990s. In the early days of the internet, libraries began providing access to holdings via online, an online catalog which looks something like this. And this was our intermediate step, with the card catalog still be, being used alongside, as you see in the background there. And today, I think we look a little bit more like this, with a mixture of technologies and access points, with provision to many types of material. And you don't even need to physically enter a library in order to take advantage of what the library has to offer. In essence, we're at a point when technology is changing faster than ever due to our online networked environment. And that is beginning to change the ways in which we all learn and work. The rate of change in the wider academic context is rapid, more so than ever before. 
the amount of data and information that we need to manage are growing at an exponential rate. This slide comes from a recent 2015 study from Bornman and Mutz, published in the Journal of the Association for Information Science and Technology. It shows that scholarly publication is now growing at a rate of 8 to 9 percent annually, which means that the volume of scholarly publication doubles approximately every nine years. 100 years ago, it would have only doubled once per century. But beyond the scholarly literature, the rate is even more staggering, with estimates of growth pegged at doubling every 12 months. In 2011, Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg said that every year for the foreseeable future, the amount of information we see on the web will double. A 2014 study from the EMC Corporation and IDC Research shows that the digital universe is growing by 40% a year in into the next decade. And by 2020, the digital universe will contain nearly as many digital bits as there are stars in the universe. By that date, the data we create and copy annually will reach 44 zettabytes. And I don't know if you know that what a zettabyte is, but I don't. <laughs> but I guess it's 44 trillion gigabytes, if that makes it any easier. Now, in addition to this, how people approach finding information has changed enormously in the past 20 years. Believe it or not, libraries are not the first place that people think of when looking for information. Google is. At my library, for example, we know that most of the traffic to our website is driven to us by Google. And Google has become so successful that it is the de facto way in which people expect to search for information. In addition to this, more and more people are accessing information via mobile devices, which are always with them wherever they go. What this tells us, and what I'm sure you already know, is that approaches to information are now vastly different than they were even 10 years ago. Lorcan Dempsey's work illustrates this monumental change when he talks about how the network reshapes the library. He says that the network is at the center rather than any physical space. Before the internet, librarians built collections for their local users who would come to the library for their use. But today, universities are connected via this network, the internet and its various tools. And that changes how research and learning are being done. The world has opened up vastly. Our communities do not need to come to the library to find information. The library is no longer at the center. The world of information is now larger than any library could house, and information is access more accessible than ever to our academic communities. Many of the workflows of faculty and students are mediated by the network, and collaboration is greater than ever. We know that as Lorcan Dempsey has said, discovery happens elsewhere. As such, libraries have needed to coordinate and scale their activities. And we see libraries moving toward collective collections, greater sharing, and new focal points related to processes within scholarly communications. The thinking about our, our role within the university has had to shift. In libraries, this leads us toward less focus on physical, building physical collections, or even the notion that we fully own the content anymore, but instead has led to a focus on access to the expanding world of information and information needs of the communities we serve. Within scholarly communication, this means a whole host of new types of information for scholarly purposes new ways to disseminate scholarly information, as well as a growing suite of tools that use the network to connect scholars in determining analysis of impact, discovery, publication, and citation. This slide shows 101 innovations in scholarly communication. And I urge you, if you haven't seen this before, to take a look. It was a poster. Um, 
and it gives a lot of those great new tools that are coming out. All of these tools and innovations are currently taking up more and more of librarians' time and energy because they are so central to the new mode of scholarly enterprise. We don't just use books, journals, and indexes anymore. This explosion of online information and the methods of scholarly communication have meant that libraries are exploring new territories and trying to find their way through the vast array of new products and methods for connecting their community of users to the information needs for academic success. Many libraries are also leading the move more toward more and more openness in scholarly communication. Institutional repositories, journal hostings, support services for open access. We know that as scholarly communication shifts, we do not need to own everything in libraries because it will be openly available via the network. I'm not sure how long that's going to take to get there before everything is openly available, but I feel confident we will get there one day and hopeful that libraries will have played a role in making that so. Our role for an area such as collections has begun to shift. So we become more than buyers and holders of content, but rather we become producers and facilitators of content access. Libraries are also becoming much more social spaces, spaces for creation and interaction for learning. Libraries remain busy centers on campus despite the fact that most library materials can be accessed online from anywhere. Libraries are gathering places where people come to learn and think. More frequently, this is being done in interactive ways with technology that spurs creation and new ways of thinking. I was very lucky to be at Queensland University of Technology last week, and I experienced the cube there in person with my own poster being displayed. It was very exciting. But more exciting was as I saw the constant stream of young people engaged in using the cube for interactive learning. And that's the exact kind of place where the library needs to situate itself. This is the type of engagement that libraries are now beginning to enhance, to embrace as we think about learning and knowledge as much more than traditional published materials. We're also seeing the rise of hacker spaces and learning commons, which provide spaces for the exchange of ideas and creation with new tools such as 3D printers, as is shown here, aiding scholars and students in their desire to learn, create, and innovate. New models of teaching and learning, in particular the shift to online learning, further affect libraries in the resources and services they provide. We have started to become embedded with online courses and need to provide support in different ways than we have in the past. So then, are academic libraries keeping up? Are we remaining relevant to our user communities? There's a need for libraries to act quickly on many issues and show value for what our services bring to support the needs of our user communities. Newer areas such as research data management, text mining, impact metrics, open access, digital preservation, all are topics more and more on the radar of libraries today while in many cases, our traditional work still continues alongside. Librarians now work in a period of ongoing change. As scholarly information continues to double over a shorter and shorter time period, as new technologies continue to be used by our communities, so too will our services need to grow and change at an increasing pace. And as such, we will need to prioritize and put more emphasis on areas that are important to the institution as a whole. Many old tasks need to continue, but must become more efficient. This is all happening much more quickly than it ever did in the past, because the way our communities use and consume information is changing at such a rapid rate. Libraries also seem to be facing great economic pressures with budget cuts during this time of change when we need to continue to grow. 
That means often tough decisions need to be made regarding priorities and where money is funneled, as well as thinking about how to do our work in new and innovative ways. There's a need for responsiveness and new solutions within libraries in order to meet the needs of faculty and students so that we remain relevant. This means being proactive, knowing what is needed, and understanding how to move ahead. Otherwise, we risk being outdated and irrelevant. I believe that taking an evidence-based approach to our practice as librarians will help us remain relevant, will guide our decisions, and make us far more competent in our work and in understanding our user communities. What then is evidence-based practice in librarianship? Very simply, it means taking a considered approach to decision-making in our practice, one that is grounded in evidence. So we no longer trust solely in our professional judgment, but also look for the best evidence we have to help guide our decisions. This includes research and local data. It means being an active, curious professional, one who questions current practice, seeks to learn more about our user communities and incorporates research as a regular part of decision making. And where no research exists, add, doing the research and adding it to our collective knowledge base. What is evidence within librarianship? Well, in the doctoral work that I completed two years ago, this was one of the key things that I examined. I found that librarians use a combination of different sources of evidence to assist in their decision making. They use published research, but also look at local data, such as e-journal usage statistics, for example. In our networked environment, the growth in availability of local data about our services and collections is growing tremendously. It's easier than ever to find out what our users are actually doing. But evidence is also tacit and part of our professional knowledge and experience that we bring to bear on each situation. Our professional knowledge, users' preferences, and the best available evidence all need to be considered in concert. An individual or group weighs the pieces of evidence and are enabled to make a more informed decision. You proceed based on best evidence and creation of new evidence in your local context. While professional experience and knowledge are important for context and interpreting evidence, the pace of change I've just described means that our profession needs to constantly assess what we are basing our knowledge on. What we have previously learned or think we know likely no longer holds true. We need to doubt ourselves more than ever before. I thought that I'd briefly outline the process of evidence-based library and information practice to give you a better sense of how it works, in theory anyway. Not that this is a static formula, but rather a bit of a guide. So the first thing is to articulate the practice-based problem or question that you have. Come to an understanding of the problem and state it clearly. This is where you need to ask, what do I already know about this problem? Clarifying existing knowledge and being honest about what assumptions or difficulties that may be obstacles. This may involve sharing background documents, having an honest discussion, and determining priorities. Consider the urgency of the situation, financial constraints, and goals you'll need to set boundaries and clearly articulate the question that requires an answer. Then you assemble evidence from multiple sources that are most appropriate to the problem at hand. So depending upon the problem or question, you need to determine what types of evidence would be best to help solve this problem. What does the literature say? What do those who will be impacted say? What information and data do we have locally? 
Do colleagues at other institutions have similar experiences that they could share? What is the most important evidence to obtain in light of the problem previously articulated? Once you've gathered that evidence, you need to assess it. This requires considering the evidence against all components of the wider overarching problem and assessing what you found in terms of its quantity and quality in order to weigh importance. What does the evidence say as a whole? You will need to ask what pieces of evidence hold the most weight and why. What evidence seems to be most trustworthy and valid? What evidence is most applicable to the current problem? And what parts of this evidence can apply to my local context? Then agree. Determine the best way forward, and if working with a group, try to achieve consensus based on the evidence and organizational goals. Ask yourself, have I or we looked at all the evidence openly and without prejudice? What is the best decision based on everything we know from the problem, the context, and the evidence? Have we considered all reasonable alternatives? How will this decision impact our library users? Is the decision in keeping with our organization's goals and values? Can I explain it with confidence? What questions still remain? Ultimately, you need to determine a course of action and begin implementation of the decision. And finally, adapt. Revisit your goals and needs. Reflect on the success of the implementation. Ask yourself now that we've begun to implement this decision, what is working, what isn't working? What else needs to be done? Are there new questions or problems arising? Evaluate the decision and how it is working in practice. And reflect on your role and your actions. Discuss the situation with others and determine any changes required so that you can continue to improve your, your service. Now this process should be a cyclical one, not just one tied to a specific question or problem as I illustrate it for simplicity's sake, but part of a normal approach to our work that includes questioning, seeking evidence, discussing how and why we are doing things, making changes, evaluating them, trying new things, and adding new knowledge to our profession. So why do I think this way of approaching library-related decisions is going to help libraries remain relevant and more useful as we transition into a new era? Why is this the right path? I believe this type of approach means that librarians will more consciously and continuous, continuously think about our services and priorities. With this type of thinking and desire to be evidence-based, we align priorities of the university with what the library is doing. We stay current in order to be more ready to respond. We will plan, set priorities, figure out how to work in new ways because those new ways are needed. We should become more comfortable with change as it becomes a constant and is not so scary. In fact, this approach will build confidence because we will become better at understanding what we are doing and why we are doing it. Gathering evidence will become the norm. Both quantitative and qualitative data will be valued and work in conjunction to help us see a more complete picture. We will know more about our users and be able to be proactive. We will be able to explain our decisions with confidence within the university and be seen as leaders in our field of knowledge. This approach will free us from old ways of thinking and allow us to move forward as we focus on the information we need to make well-informed decisions rather than what is comfortable for us. Taking this approach provides us with a fresh start and a way of doing things. But it is necessary that we build a culture within our organizations that embraces this way of approaching our decision making. This is not just about individual librarians. 
To be truly successful, the entire library needs to be doing this. Supervisors and senior administrators need to support it or otherwise it will fail. My doctoral work showed that when librarians were in an environment that supported evidence use in their decision making, the librarians in those cases were able to move decisions forward in a positive manner and felt empowered to make positive change. And they wanted to, they really did. Such change becomes easier because it is supported by evidence. But when the work environment did not support an evidence-based approach, librarians felt hopeless and unable to move ahead because they lacked support even though they were trying to make evidence-based change. Those in positions of power within academic libraries will really determine the success of this approach, which if embraced, I believe, will only strengthen their position within the senior levels of university administration. Going down this path should lead to a new mindset of openness and curiosity and a way of working where we are continually evaluating and wanting to improve upon our services, where questions are embraced and are no longer daunting. New projects are set up with evaluation in mind. Failure does not mark an end, but is a learning process for what could be done better or differently in the future. Over time, this accumulation of evidence and, the way of, and this way of approaching librarianship practice will become natural and enable librarians to know they are making good decisions. We start to think about possibilities and look forward to change, to wider goals and new services. And we contribute outwardly to the knowledge base within our profession. All of this contributes to the profile of both the library and the university as leaders in our community and ultimately should have positive impacts for our local user communities. Ultimately, maybe hopefully, evidence-based practice will become the normal way that librarians do their work. Now personally, I want to feel like these kids every day that I go to work. And I feel this way when I know I'm doing something that matters, when I'm discovering and learning and making new steps forward. And this, I believe, is how librarians can contribute to an important part of the, to, a, to being a vibrant academic com community. As academic librarians, we must be able to show that what we are doing matters. We need to tie our work to meaningful outcomes and successes. We need to build teams that understand goals, needs, directions, and can figure out the best way to successfully meet those goals. We need to celebrate our successes and feel good about what we are doing. To have our, our user community recognize and celebrate what we are doing and how we as librarians are integral to the life of the university. Now in the past we would say that we have X number of books and journals and count that as being successful or a way to show that we are better than another library. The number of books on our shelves was our measure of success and that no longer holds. Now we need to say, so what? Are the students and the faculty using those books? Do they have what they need to do their work and study? How does this content contribute to the university's success? How do our services contribute to the university's success? And what is our impact? Evidence-based practice can help bring us closer to those answers, to being more confident in our work and to connecting with our communities. So thank you very much. I'm very excited to hear your thoughts and further engage in conversation on this topic. And I'm happy to answer any questions.
Uh, my question is uh, about the take up of this approach by your staff. So, do you, you obviously use this on a day to day basis, but how, what was the take up like of the staff at your university libraries? Yeah, well, I can't. Um I can't say that there's been an enormous take up as such um, because it was never laid out where I work that this is how we will approach practice. I think that that's the role that our um, university librarians, our senior administrators could take uh, for there to perhaps be greater buy-in. Um, in my case, I quietly work away trying for myself So because I've never been told that I need to work this way. I think it's important. So I try for myself to integrate what I can into my work and into those that I work with. That's never straightforward or easy. Um, so I can't say I've, I've met any of the, the goals that I've outlined here in this presentation. I think I can point to some instances maybe, but um, I think we, I and my university too have a long way to go. But I really do feel in the last few years that it is starting to settle in and, and everyone is starting to approach and start to think and talk about um, how we do incorporate evidence into our decisions. And so even in the last year, I've really noticed a change in that and it, and it makes me very happy. Can I throw back a question then to all of you? Maybe, uh, what, what is your experience? Are any of you trying to work in this way? Are there obstacles that you, you are really struggling with? Or? Denise, I'll yes. jump in there. Um, so last week we did have the 8th International yes. Evidence-Based Library and Information Practice uh, Conference in Brisbane. And um, these sorts of questions were being posed there. One big one that keeps jumping up time and time again when you talk to people is, um, love the idea of it, mm. I'm just so busy. I don't have the time. Yeah. What sort of strategies or advice would you to give to people who sort of say, you know, make the, that's a reality, that is the lived mm -hmm. reality of their busy day-to-day -day lives of, of trying to deliver their library services and, and function within their context. context. Yeah. How, do that, how do we be evidence-based when we've got so much, mm -hmm. so many things on our, on our plate, so many demands? Yeah, it's a valid concern. Uh, I think that... Um, the way that I look at it, and those people who know me know that I, I try very much to strip the word busy out of my vocabulary. <laughs> um, and a friend of mine um, and I both um, make sure we do that. <laughs> so sometimes having someone to prompt you along is a good thing. But, um, but in all seriousness, I think what we need to do is um, really take those moments to reflect and think about our practice and what is important to us and set our priorities because if something is a priority for you then you are going to make time for it. So think about all the things you're doing and the things that are really not priorities but you wind up doing them every single day because they're just part of that normal busyness of the day and what can you do to start to flip that around and say well today this is more important and I'm going to do something about it and make that time. If you're very, very lucky, you might work in a place where that gives you time for research, for example. Um, some of my colleagues at other institutions have that. Um, we can kind of fit it in, but it's like an extra, so you just kind of do what you can where you can. And um, personally, I always try to make research a priority, so I think it's really important. Thank you. We have um, over 50 people connecting in online, so there's oh, a lot wow. of virtual people listening in, and there is a question here that one of them has posed, so bear mm -hmm. with me while I paraphrase what they're asking. Um, do you think that the take-up take up to this of take up to this approach of professional practice is lesser because of workload issues, uncertainty about how much time this approach may take? Yeah, so I guess that's similar to the previous question, and and yeah, I think that it, it's a concern because we all seem to be doing more with less these days. And so I think, as I, I tried to point out in the talk, that I, I think we need to start setting those priorities for what is important. Um, librarians, I think, in my experience anyway, have a really hard time of letting things go. And we need to let things go. We need to say, that was, you know, that was important at the time. 
it's no longer as high a priority and I really need to be putting my time elsewhere. And then if you start to incorporate an evidence-based approach as a part of what you do rather than just here's the day-to-day -day tasks, so you, you're then thinking about it more. You're thinking, why am I doing this? Um, what, are the, the impact, what is the impact of this going to be? And letting that lead you as opposed to what is the exact detailed process for doing this today? And our um, online um, participants are in fine form. We have another question. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, so how do we introduce this into an environment where university students can be often be over-surveyed? Will, uh, mm -hmm. will, we, will we be able to get an accurate reflection or engagement in light of that? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, depending upon the individual circumstances, you, you're going to need to take different approaches. Um, it's interesting that the survey is mentioned, and yeah, I think we, we do often over-survey, and one of the defaults that librarians rely on is going to a survey. Um, in fact, the, one of the, the cohort from the IRGL out of the US, the Research Institute last year, um, they, a group from their, um, uh, were inspired on learning all these new research methods and things that they could be doing and and uh, it led them to write an article that came out in library in the lead pipe a number of months ago um, and um, they have a hashtag called ditch the survey <laughs> so try and and that's not to say that you know surveys are useless they're often very good in the right circumstances but we need to think beyond surveys so think about other ways to engage our user communities um, even observation, um, if you implement something new as a librarian and you observe then how it works, rather than just um, doing so in a passive way, turn that into uh, research by writing it down in detail. Because when you write it down, you have that history and track record of it over time, and you can see the kind of feedback that you're getting, um, how people are, or how people are using something. Um, so it's all going to depend. If you're changing a website, you probably want to engage in some um, usability testing, for example. You may want to be getting um, using focus groups to get feedback from different groups of students, undergraduates, graduate students, that kind of thing. But it's really um, depending upon your question. And I think it's a matter of thinking about it in new ways and also maybe, you know, talking with somebody who can give you new ideas too. Sometimes we just need to throw things off of other people, maybe from another institution, um, to get their insights and what might work. I have one more question, okay. but I thought I'd just open it to the floor. <laughs> I don't want to hold it all. Um, one of the other very frequently commented um, comments made, besides the I'm too busy, I don't have a lot of time, <laughs> is I don't know how to do this. Right. I'm a librarian. Mm -hmm. I didn't receive um, that sort of training and research and data collections and analysis. Um, what sort of suggestions would you um, offer to mm -hmm. um, the library profession more broadly in terms of, well, okay, you, if you're feeling a little uncomfortable, you're feeling you don't know how to do this, mm -hmm. what, could, what could they do? Yeah. Well... Um I think that there are starting to be more institutes um, to help librarians learn those research skills. And um, when you introduced me, you mentioned, for example, the Librarians Research Institute in Canada that I've been a part of. Um, and that grew out of librarians saying to our Canadian Association of Research Libraries that this is something that we need. So number one, talk about it. Make, be vocal that this is something you need. And then probably a, a program, if it doesn't already exist, may grow. Um, and what that institute is trying to do is also create community. So within Canada, very large space, we're very spread out. Um, but trying to make networks amongst like-minded people who also want to engage in research so that then um, we have peers and mentors who we can call upon when we have that kind of need and want to get feedback, want to get more information. But attending um, a continuing education session like that, finding a mentor, I think that those of us who are in positions um, that can should encourage then uh, perhaps the mentorship within our universities, pairing up, looking to also to our, um, our 
beyond the library, but the expertise that we have within the university in terms of research and support. Um, so often there are things like writing centers and research support networks. If you need statistical analysis help, there are likely statisticians on campus that will help you with those things. Um, I think the first important part is to figure out your question and how you're going to be able to approach it. And then usually the rest um, can fall into place with help from, from those around you. And so I would say just try to be engaged and um, get started even though you don't feel that you have you know, all those skills or maybe the confidence. Because, and start with something small and then grow from there. Thank you. And we do have one more question from um, our 50 plus people who are connecting in virtually. Um, from Lindy, have you ever used an action learning approach to adopting this approach of evidence-based practice? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think action learning is really important. I'm going to try to talk about that a little bit here tomorrow with the librarians in the workshop that I'm going to do. Um, action um, research really is um, very much um, along the same lines as the evidence-based practice um, uh, a cycle. So very similar in that, you know, you think about a practice-based problem, you figure out what you might want to do to solve that, and then you put it into action, and you test it you, uh, through observation, through um, either qualitative or quantitative measures. You get that information back, and then as part of that cycle, you keep revising until you get it right. This has frequently been used in education, for example, um, and I think it's something that we can adopt in libraries. It's very much about your local context. So this is a good way actually to begin taking on a research mindset without you know, needing to do a great big research project. But it's research that would be meaningful to you in your local context and you immediately can make change and see how that impacts perhaps the students that you're working with. So I do think it is really important. Um, one thing that I did a number of years ago when I worked in health was we were, we had, as librarians, we were in problem-based learning groups with the medical students. This took up a lot of time and energy. Uh, we knew we were contributing to um, outcomes there, but did it really make any difference um, to be in those problem-based learning groups as a librarian as opposed to uh, the other instruction that we did with the students, for example, because it was so time intensive. So we tested this by um, you know, going into half of those um, problem-based learning groups with librarians, and the other half let them go on with their normal uh, instructors as the facilitators. And basically the outcome was that it didn't, um, it didn't make any real difference. It didn't, it didn't hurt either or anything like that, but it was the groups came out the same in the end. So we decided after that to take a different approach rather than needing to be there for so many hours every single week within the problem-based learning, but to support that in other ways because a piece of that evidence for us was the staffing time and, and the energy that would need to be put into that. And then when we saw it didn't actually make, it didn't increase the students' output in terms of their uh, marks or how they did in the course or their understanding of the material, then we thought, well, we should maybe think about making an, a different approach. So that's just an example of where you, how you can incorporate that into the, the teaching that you're already doing, for example. Yeah. We have another question here also from Lindy. Um, what are some channels to identify problems that the library may not see but the users have? Hmm. That is a really good point. Um, well, I think you have to be engaged then with your users in order to be hearing them. So whatever way that that probably works best for you in your context. Um, if you are out um, in classes regularly, getting that feedback from students, for example. Um, something that we just uh, started this past year that my colleagues at the University of Alberta started um, was to have an, a library advisory group of students. And so we meet regularly with those students and we can bring up different topics with them just to get their feedback. So the students have committed to be on this group for a certain amount of time. They love it. They, they get to give us feedback um, that's taken very seriously. So things like that, I think you can 
um, do, um, even monitoring uh, through social media the kinds of complaints and questions and all those kinds of things that come up, like it should trigger something in you. One, one uh, bit of negative feedback doesn't uh, mean the world's going to end, but it should make you perhaps think and reconsider and give a little more thought to what you're doing and then maybe test it further. Any other questions from the folk present here? Um, Denise, just uh, wondering, sometimes that, that point that you made about um, a good decision may not necessarily mean a, uh, a comfortable decision. Mm -hmm. So when the evidence is telling you something that your gut or the people <laughs> above you's gut or preference didn't doesn't match, yes. how do you get over that um, that hurdle of, of giving unwelcome news or giving a, a solution that's not the preferred solution? Um, I actually think that if we create a culture where we can be open and talk about what we, what our gut tells us, but that we're going to look at other things because we don't, we're no longer able to just rely on our professional experience or that tacit knowledge, that gut feeling that we, we have, then we'll be able to talk about it. So it's really about the openness because I think otherwise, if you're going to be rejected because you put something forward, people immediately shut down. So we, I think we need to create an environment, a culture where we can talk about these things. We can say what we think, but we can say, in order to back that up a little bit more, we want to draw upon evidence. If the evidence is not there, we'll go out and make some evidence by uh, testing things, by putting things in place. Um, but yeah, it's very difficult because really what that comes down to is the interaction between individuals. And ultimately, um, in libraries, most of us as individuals don't make the big, hard decisions. We might contribute to them, and we work much more in groups on those big decisions. But ultimately, it goes up to whomever is in charge of the library, and they're going to do what they want. And that's what I was talking about in terms of the negative workplace. It was seen as very negative when you put a lot of work into something, and you try to base that on the existing evidence. Um, but for whatever reason, it's been shot down. So I think that to get beyond that, we don't even, like we don't work in isolation and then hand that off for the, the chief librarian, the university librarian to make a decision. We can have those conversations so that we're all on the same page and understanding because if I put something forward and it's rejected, I'm gonna feel bad and often we don't talk. But if I put something forward and we have a conversation and I can understand why it was rejected, maybe then I can see the reasoning why. And vice versa, if I can explain why I think that because of my expertise, but on top of that, the evidence in this particular area, because if it's something in collections, like for me, uh, that's my job, and I, you know, I do have an expertise in that area, I'm gonna also gather evidence. And if I put something forward, I think I would expect that in most cases it should be accepted. Right, it's not always going to be the case, and so I think there has to be that a real open two-way communication, so that rather than feeling like you um, are not respected, you actually can understand the whole of the situation better. I don't have a question as such, um, but a comment. During your presentation, I'm, um, I'll try and paraphrase you, you made a comment along the lines of um, evidence-based practice leads to a change or, or new mindsets. And this mm -hmm. whole idea of um, evidence-based practice um, being a trigger for perhaps changing the way we think of ourselves as professionals and mm -hmm. the ways in which we behave and are as um, yes. in our professional practice is quite an interesting one. Mm. I just wondered if you had anything else you wanted to say on that. Yeah, I think it's been key for me because it, um, it, it makes me feel that I can, um, in all cases, proceed with greater awareness. Um, but it's really about being curious in practice, in doubting myself, um, so that I can only 
be better and learn new things and contribute more to both my workplace and beyond. I think that we don't have um, the greatest evidence base in the world in our profession and we need to improve upon it. So for me, that took me down a path of doing um, more real research, <laughs> research that um, others could use. Um, I shouldn't have said the word real. But um, yeah, so I do think it is a mindset because also once you have that mindset, you're more open to that change that I think right now for our profession is inevitable, that is happening rapidly. And we have to be ready to deal with that because otherwise um, we will be behind. We will um, miss the boat, so to speak, and others will pick up those pieces where we are not. And I think librarians have a lot to offer and are very valuable to the university community and we need to continue to show that, um, that we embrace those changes but we do so in a thoughtful manner, in a rigorous manner and what therefore we propose going forward is, um, is worthwhile listening to, I suppose. Thank you very much and I think on that very positive and um, wise note, we might um, take a moment to say thank you very much for thank being you, with Helen. us today and a small gift oh, to say thank you. you. Oops, wrong way. I was going to say that we do have a um, date holder for our next USQ salon. So we try to hold these events once a month and our next one will be taking place on the 28th of August um, with the topic of open education and open educational practice and how we can um, instill a, a culture and practice of, of openness within our universities, um, education, learning and other activities. So watch this space. We will be tweeting more details and of course you can find some more details on the webpage. Um, so on that note, I think it's been a really wonderful um, USQ salon and I thank you for joining us. The 50 something plus people we've had connecting in from all across um, not just Australia, but I suspect the world. So thank you very much. Um, goodbye.